So just so you know that you're in the right place, we're speaking today about the basics of project evaluation for effective outreach. And I am Leslie, as I said, from uh, Veg Fund, and we'll be joined later today by Pablo Molman from ProVeg International Netherlands, who is looking at um, an interesting evaluation for a veggie challenge that Pablo is running in the Netherlands and throughout other countries as well. So he'll serve as a nice, nice case study for our conversations today. Um, this is the second of, a, let's see, six webinars that we have coming up in a Veg Fund activist learning uh, series. And so we hope that you might consider attending our other webinars that are scheduled in 2018. Uh, you can see the four of those webinars there. And of course, you can sign up and find us at vegfund.org, which would be most likely the same place where you found this webinar. Um, so before I, I guess, get too deeply into this, um, I just wanna say, you know, first off, thank you for attending. And the catalyst for our having chosen this topic about evaluation really came from our activist base, which has been giving us information about some skills development topics that would be of interest to them. And evaluation was one of those topics that really rose to the top. For those of you who have may, may have used our fluid review system, um, you'll see that we're asking you now information about your skills development interest. And again, evaluation was really one of those top areas that people were interested in. Now, what we've also noticed is while there's a lot of interest in evaluation, our activist base is not presently practicing much evaluation of their events. And so for that reason, today we are shaping or scoping this conversation very much around the basics of evaluation. So we're not going to be going into, you know, in-depth detail about how to conduct an evaluation. It is more about what are some of the thoughts about the theories, the basic theories, the definitions, and to consider some of the key inputs that would form an evaluation. So pending the, you know, success of this event and your continued interest, we would be delighted to go deeper into other aspects of, evalu of evaluation. Um, but we thought today, given what we know about our activist base and the audience, that we would start with the basics. So um, I think this first slide that I'm letting you absorb while I, uh, I talk about, um, you know, the uh, our interest in doing further work with you all in evaluation is that evaluation is difficult in the best of circumstances. And um, before I really say more about that, why don't we just jump in and start the conversation more formally? So the underpinning of evaluation, so this evaluation, right, that you would do at the end of a project, the underpinning of it is really the theory of change. And the theory of change is effectively a logic model. So what it's doing, it is capturing our rationale that if we, say an activist, take some action and we, with that action, reach people and convince them to consider new ways of being, we are suggesting that we believe that we'll end up in some point in the future we'll end up with some result or we'll end up seeing some kind of change that we desire to see in the world. Um, so we're saying if we do X, it will lead others to do Y and that will result in some kind of change showing up in the world. So an evaluation um, is effectively meant to test the evidence or the validity of your logic model that would be tied to the results. So it's trying to test the validity of the a theory of change that you might establish for your particular action. So for example, um, there, are four, there are four stages, right? Or theory of, state, the theory of change components. So we have some kind of an activity. It could be a film screening, it could be food sampling, it could be a veggie challenge, it could be a veg fest. It could be literally a million things that would lead to some output that individuals are newly exposed to new knowledge and practices, right? You've told them something in the film screening or through the vehicle of the food sample in which these individuals who came to you or came to your event, they've learned something new. 
Now the gambit is, and what we're betting on is that because we held this activity and the individuals learned something, that they'll do something at some point in the future um, with this new knowledge that they have gained from us. So what we're betting on is that we'll see changed attitudes among the people we've reached and that that will lead to some kind of changed behavior in the future. And in the longer term, we might reach this ultimate goal, let's say, for example, of getting people to stop eating animals. So for those of you who are on the webinar today or for those of you who have signed up or for everyone who's a veg fund activist or for anyone who's doing activism activism in, in any sector really, there are prospectively you know, thousands of theory of change components or ch theories of change happening at any one time because your theory of change um, may lead to the same result as someone else who's doing some other activity, but you might anticipate different outputs or different outcomes along the line. But, you know, there, there could be multiple theories of change happening out there in the world at, at any one point in time. Okay, so when we set up this logic model and we decide to do an activity such as hosting a film screening, we're making assumptions about why we are hosting that film screening and what's going to happen. So obviously when you decide to host a film screening, you have to say, well, I think a hundred people will come and I think a hundred will not be vegan and 50 might be vegan. And at any rate, I need to go secure a venue that would enable me to host at least 150 people. Um, so and you make some assumptions, right, about who's going to come. And to encourage people to come, you do things like you organize the screening and you advertise it. You see that people attend the screening. It's an assumption. You're going to assume that people are coming because you're doing it. And you feel that the attendees will probably think about the screening visuals and the script content. So again, these are your assumptions, right, as an activist, as you're deciding to organize the screening. And you're doing all this because you believe after the screening at some point in the future that individuals are going to take that new knowledge as learned from the screening. They're going to believe the information that they saw. They're going to know how to act on the information. So if you told them to be vegan, that maybe they'll understand um, how to now, you know, prepare vegan foods that, for example, they'll have the support of their friends and family to do this, and that because some vegans came who maybe have some recidivist tendencies, right, those people who backslide sometimes from veganism, they'll be so inspired by this film that they'll get back on the wagon and they'll readopt their vegan behaviors. Now, what could happen, of course, is you're still trying to work toward this ultimate long-run result that people stop eating animals. And you know, you're saying, I'm doing this film screening for that reason. Now, what clearly could happen is, let's just say your activity is today, and therefore you're realizing the outputs of that activity today, right? You, a film screening is going to happen, and people are going to come, and people are going to think about what you've done. Um, however, they may not take action on what they learned just today as they leave the theater. It might take them one day to take action. It might take them three months to take action. It might take them six months to take action. So what we're suggesting is that there's a time horizon to the theory of change. You do something, something happens, but the ultimate result of the people um, for whom you are trying to convince, they may not take action today, but some point in the future. So if they're not gonna take action until some point in the future, you may not get all the way there in one day or three months or a year even with realizing your ultimate long run result, but just the same, there might be some movement among those people toward your long run result. So it's all good, even if you're not realizing today, you know, the ultimate, long run result that you showed a film and all people stopped eating animals. I mean, we would love that, but it may not be realistic. But just to suggest that given that time horizon, um, it does seemingly require some patience.
Okay, so you're making assumptions about the event that you're holding. Now, in evaluation, what we're really trying to do is we've held some event and into the future, we want to see some evidence that what we assumed about these assumptions that we made, we wanna see some evidence that our assumptions came true. And so we go out into the world and we measure into the future what actually happened from this past event that we organized and held. So remember we said, if we do X, then Y will happen. And in our assumptions too, we could say, and the time frame will be, you know, whatever, three months, six months, 12 months, 10 years into the future. So when we look at measurement, we go back and we say, well, how many screenings did we actually hold? Well, let's just say we did one. And how many hours did it take me to organize this activity? What was the cost to hold the screening? What was the licensing fee? The output. How many people actually came? I, I said I anticipated that 150 would come. Did 150 come or did 50 come? And of those people came, who were vegan, who were non-vegan, and how many people stayed for the entire documentary? Because if a lot of people walked out, then my assumption that these individuals were convinced by new messages, they would not have even have heard the messages, right? So in our measurement in the future, sometime you know, post the actual date of the event, we are going to measure what actually happened and this is effectively the evaluation so we're looking at you know what so sometime in the future at that outcome let's say six months after the film was shown what proportion of that target population really recall the information from the screening say okay i'm sorry three months later now you know what proportion of those people actually recall the information and then i'm going to make some attempted link of causality that people saw my film, three months later, they recalled the information and I went and I spoke to them again, nine months later to find out how many people were still eating meat after the screening. You know, our desire is zero, right? But we, we do need to do a measurement. So what I'm showing you here is that, and let's back up a little bit, you um, make assumptions about what's going to happen by some kind of an, um, uh, an uh, whew, outreach event and that you're going to measure into the future what actually happened. All right, so what you can see then as we've gone through adding assumptions to our theory of change and measurement that evaluation is a systematic method for collecting, analyzing, and using information because we want to answer questions about our outputs and our outcomes that we added into the design of our, our event or our project, right? And if everything works to plan, we're going to see a connection between the fact that we hosted a film screening and people stopped eating meat or some proportion of people stopped eating meat like the more the better from our point of view so that's the essence of evaluation um, that you're doing something and that there's causality of what you're doing to what is happening for the result so that's the essence of evaluation now so the questions that this evaluation kind of hopes to answer are you know did our assumptions about our outputs and our outcomes hold and to what scale. So let's say, for example, we showed the film to uh, 100 people and into the future, we found out that we showed the film to 100 people and actually one person only changed their behavior. So we just spent you know, a lot of time and who knows, $3,000 to show this film and we found out that one person changed their behavior. So we would have to ask ourselves, well, is that because people are no longer going to consider this information into the future, not even five or 10 or 15 years from now? Does that mean that's it? People are done. They're not going to consider what we told them. If that were the case, we would say, wow, then it just took me $3,000 to 
get that one individual to consider my messages and to consider dietary change. And I thought all along that we were going to show the film to 100 people and that at least 50 would hear my message and change their behavior about their dietary preferences. So I thought we were going to be able to do this for $60 a person and here it's cost me roughly $3,000 per a, per a person to get that change. So the evaluation helps you answer these things about your assumptions, about your outcomes, your outputs, um, and you're measuring these things to see if what you thought would happen happened and also if there is causality between what you did and what the result was. So, you know, we, we can see um, in this one case that I suggested that if, if we only have one person who uh, became vegan after your film, they, uh, everyone else effectively falls in this gap, right? Because you did not realize your ultimate long run result. And by the way, I don't want to be critical of that. I mean, I, I, I think as, as I've put at the end, I've really met very few vegan people who didn't say to me, well, my journey began with, the point being that I think for many people, veganism is a personal journey and it takes a number of activities along some time continuum before people, you know, finally land that they stop eating animals. So it's not to discourage you to say, well, you just shouldn't have done that film screening. Um, because all those other 99 people who didn't become vegan, that's not to suggest that your information wasn't valuable and it could be the next message that came along that might push them over the edge. However, you would have to take a look at your own, you know, cost effectiveness with that activity and say, should I do that again? Should I switch it up? Should I do something else? Should I consider different audiences? So at any rate, um, Evaluation is looking at that thing, the, the cost effectiveness, but also, I guess you would say, the social effectiveness of did I reach my goal or did I not, or how far along that continuum did I achieve at least incremental behavior change for the people who saw the film. So it would be fair to say about the nature of evaluation then, Evaluation work really is, you know, a very rigorous academic and professional practice. It, it's really, it's not a casual pastime. I mean, in this day and age, you can go get a degree in doing evaluation work. You know, you can get a master's degree in doing evaluation or get a certificate in their, you know, national conferences and their textbooks. And so it's an actual rigorous practice. And so if you as an activist are intimidated by the notion of doing evaluation, it would be perfectly understandable because it's, it's, um, it's kind of an art and a science. So it would all be very understandable that many of you have said, well, I'm very curious about this, but I haven't really, you know, jumped into doing evaluation yet on my own. Totally understandable. Um, the other nature of evaluation is that Vegan outreach and the evaluation thereof involves the design and implementation implementation, excuse me, of events for people, I could put in parentheses, non-vegans, who are subject to many influences. So that's going to make it all the more difficult to do, you know, an effective outreach and therefore an effective evaluation. Now, why is this? Well, because I think most of us know. Vegan activism is ultimately about human behavior change, right? Like the animals are all fine, but we're trying to change human beings. And, you know, behavior change is a really tough sell. And this sets up pitfalls in our logic model that we are going to force, you know, certain outcomes. This definitely um, makes it all the more difficult for us to do evaluation because we're, it, it's probably in many instances going to dump our suggested outcomes on their head. And when we go back out and look at our assumptions and measure, we're gonna find out that we fell short because we didn't get people all the way to the end line, right, of stopping um, the eating of animals. And not to mention, so we're dealing with individuals who are already, you know, challenged by, you know, some of the, the conversations that we have in, in the world of, of veganism. 
but they're also profoundly influenced by society. I mean, think about, you know, behaviors are naturally enforced by the norms of all of these influences from religion, from politics to, you know, economic conversations, everything that you can imagine. And I think it's fair to say that for a lot of people, they change their diet in resonance with other people, right? With other people with whom they socialize, who are like them, who are part of their tribe, if you will. So between the complexity of dealing with individuals or groups of indiv individuals, all of us are profoundly influenced um, by society. So again, these two factors or, or facts, I should say, really set up many complications as you're trying to get all the way to that end line of getting people to stop eating animals or whatever your goal may be. I've thrown that out as the goal. And I think for all of us on the call today, that would be our primary goal. Um, but you know, you could have uh, a million other incremental goals in between that. But at any rate, these are two confounding factors um, for trying to reach your actual results. So what we're doing is, you know, we because we're, we're out there, we're, we're seeking to change people's knowledge, right? Like, how many times have all of us heard this? Where do you get your protein? I mean, it, it's, it's something that people don't understand that, you know, protein is um, found in many places besides animal products. And then, of course, we're trying to change people's attitudes, right? Like, are you a part of a cult? That is something that really resonates with me. I mean, people don't even, under, they don't understand the definition of vegan. They think that veganism is a very strange concept. Um, so, you know, we're trying to change knowledge. We're trying to change um, attitudes. And we're trying to change practices and behaviors of people that are embedded. So, you know, on this slide, I'm not suggesting we're trying to teach someone how to cut a cucumber. We're trying to teach somebody to adopt a um, you know a whole new way of eating and a way of being so that's very complicated quite frankly so when you are thinking about your action right you're going to do um, a, a film screening or food sampling whatever you're going to do you need to think about that action of course with the end result in mind right? The change that you're trying to see in the world, but you are asking people to react to your messages and to your action um, who really should be considered first. Because if you're not pitching your messages to these folks who never even say heard the term vegan or don't know where to shop or think the food is weird or think that humane slaughter is okay for them. If your action does not start with the baseline of messages, the baseline knowledge of these folks who you're trying to reach, then you're gonna have a mismatch of trying to convince them because you might take them too far, try to take them too far. You might be completely insulting to them. You might have insulted their religion. I mean, there could be a million things where there would be a gap between what you plan to do and what's in the content of your messaging and where these people are on the spectrum of understanding veganism. So even though we ultimately want to zoom forward in time to the result, we really need to start to think about our action and the design of it with the baseline knowledge attitudes and practices of the people we're going to go out and reach. And that's very complicated because for all you know, at one moment in time, you're going to be talking to a 16 year old and then a 60 year old, you know, and they're going to come into that conversation with very different, with a very different base of knowledge, perspectively, with very different attitudes and very different, um, things that they practice at home or different influences. Maybe the 16 year old is not allowed to ask for, you know, vegan menus inside their household yet. Maybe their parents are not, you know, going to accept that. So it's very complicated. And the way that typically one would collect the information about these different groupings of people, I mean, can be quite sophisticated, right? It could be that it's done through focus groups or individual interviews or surveys or polls 
or by looking at you know big Facebook data. Um, so I mean, there are organizations that do nothing but try to understand the demographics of people. So for for, for activists, you know, I mean, it's really quite complicated to be able to pitch your messages at the right level to have the proper empathy for for these groups of people when you may not have you know the resources um, to be able to go out and segregate these target markets if you will and also to know how to get the people to properly um, extract the information from them and furthermore think too you know you may go out with um, let's just say a leaflet right if you go out with a leaflet and now today, every kid between the ages of 16 to you know 40 or something are on the phone. They're just not interested in holding a piece of paper in their hand anymore. Then the channel in which you're trying to reach them, the design of your action might be inappropriate for the audience. So you have to think about how much time am I going to be able to spend with each of these people before they'll start to just, you know, their eyes will glaze over and they don't want to hear from me anymore. Um, what's, you know, how much time, what's the proper format? Should it be mobile based? Should it be a piece of paper? Should it be some kind of a, you know, toy? Should it be, I don't know, what other gadget to get my message to them? So the point is that you know, we, we like to jump straight in with our action because we are like raring to go. We are ready to go into whatever we want to do. But in reality, we really need to start with the people we're trying to reach and think about the channels and the best ways to reach them. Now, please don't forget yourself as the other key human element in vegan outreach, the vegan activist. Why is that? because you as well need to understand kind of all those things that I, you have to have savvy about speaking to these different audiences, right? If you don't have savvy about speaking to um, a mother compared to a grandmother, compared to a child, compared to one nationality to another, if you don't have some sense of um, how to effectively interact with them, or let's say, you know, you have a, tendency to mumble or you get really nervous or you become defensive in your speaking, there's a, a really um, high probability that your action is not going to be very convincing to people. So while in our um, desire for effectiveness, we always think about, you know, what's wrong with those darn people? I just told them really interesting, um, you know, earth shattering, important information. Why are they not reacting? We must remember that our ultimate result and outcome can be as much about us as the people um, whom we are reaching. So you're a very important part as an activist in motivating people, in trying to guide their outcomes, and in ultimately trying to get them to you know, reach the thing that you want to see changed in the world. So if we were taught to tie that up, we're just saying, if you ignore, logical thought one, if we ignore these knowledge, attitudes, and practices of the people we want to reach, and we don't design appropriate interventions, then we really should not anticipate our desired results, because there's a high probability, you know, that we're going to fall straight on our face. So, logical thought number two, vegan outreach and the evaluation thereof is for patient people. So remember, we, we looked at originally uh, in the theory of change that sometimes the results only come very, very far into the future. And that's because people who begin the vegan journey, it can take a number, a number, number of interventions over years for them to finally get there. So you've got to be patient um, as we continue this work in vegan activism. And this idea really bears out in a diffusion of innovation theory. Now, there's no timeline here on the bottom um, because this timeline, I suppose, would vary. But actually, in this theory, it's saying that when some new innovation, you know, comes into the world, so this could be the iPhone, it can be veganism, you know, it could be plant-based eating, whatever it could be, there's a timeline, if you will, for the uh, majority of people, majority of the population to adopt that innovation. 
So what we know right now um, is, at least from research that we have from, say, Faunalytics, for example, who does a lot of work um, in vegan in the vegan space for understanding, you know, doing evaluations and understanding what is happening out there in our quest to um, make people stop eating animals. They've actually predicted that in the United States, for example, perhaps only 0.5% are actually vegans, and that maybe as many as 3.4% are vegetarian. So you think of all of the years in which maybe you've been engaged in vegan activism or, you know, all the things that um, are, are happening in the space. And at the end of the day, we are really still in our infancy. Um, if those numbers um, hold true, because there's only roughly 3% at the most, right, of the world's population and probably much less than that, who are actually operating in this tale of living a vegan lifestyle. So if we look at the diffusion of innovation theory, we know that uh, it's going to take some time before we pick up, say, the next 13.5% of people. Now, you know, there's there's lots of great influences today. I mean, we know, you know, there's there's Beyond Meat. Um, Eric Schmidt of Google said that he thought that um, the meat alternatives, and in that case, he meant cultured meat, not Beyond Meat, which is plant based, but the cultured meat was one of the greatest, you know, technological innovations to come. Um, we have grocery stores emerging, the the Lucky Foods chain. Um, so things are happening out there that could help us reach tipping points to drive people faster it, to adopt veganism and that will, you know, will will we'll drive along the spectrum to get to the late majority. Um, the late j majority, when you say, I found it at Sam's Club, this is suggesting that now the thing is broadly accepted in society, right? Because it's showing up in a major retail chain and um, it's no longer only found at, you know, these, you know, small hole in the wall vegan restaurants. Um, but what we risk in the vegan sector at the present is you see the, the, the chasm here means that some innovations never really take off. So, you know, some innovations never re reach Ashton Kutcher. This, you can tell this is really old because I never hear about Ashton Kutcher anymore. So at any rate, some innovations never take off and the, the innovation um, falls in the in the chasm. So we hope that that's not where we are. We we hope that this you know plant based food developments um, that are becoming more mainstream, the fact that we have big time investment in some of the the cultured meat, the cultured clean meat <coughs> companies. Excuse me. And um, we hope that it's going to take off and that we're actually going to quickly climb this curve. But the division. Diffusion of innovation theory suggests that, you know, things just take time and, th and that we have to be patient and um, hope that there are things that come along to make us hit tipping points. So the stages of change um, is just uh, another model to suggest that if you combine it with what we just looked at. Hmm. Most of the world is actually not even in the pre, well, they're in the pre-contemplation stage at the best, um, meaning <laughs> that they're kind of living at ignorance is bliss. You know, they're not really thinking about veganism. They may know the word now, but they're not necessarily very close to getting into action. So they're not very close to going around this circle, going from you know, getting out of ignorance of bl as bliss into, well, I learned some things. I'm kind of sitting on the fence about it. And, you know, now I'm, I'm becoming more determined and now I'm going to take action. Most of the world is here at pre-contemplation. But as we move people around the circle down to action with each event or with each message, you're building their knowledge about veganism and its benefits um, about how they can change, you know, their attitudes about um, helping society and, and jumping into vegan living. But we also know that we do have um, a fair amount of evidence for vegan recidivism, right, of people who 
have gone through the circle, they say, I'm vegan, but then they relapse. So this kind of fits into the stages of, of change model that we shouldn't necessarily be surprised by that. But when people relapse, we have to try to find ways to get them back to action, you know, and into maintenance again. So this is a virtuous circle of why all of these events that we're undertaking, you know, they're really actually very important to keep the messages out there um, percolating and to continue to build networks and alliances and collaborations and to try to mainstream veganism um, as something that has merit and to drive it to, you know, getting people to stop eating animals. So at this point, um, you all might be feeling like, this all sounds really gloomy, and why did I attend this stupid webinar? And is there any hope at all to evaluate my efforts? Well, I wanna say that I think there is some hope. And now we switch to a green slide just to um, ally that with hope. I don't know if green is hope, but for today, we're going from gray to green. So we can gather evidence for effectiveness. So I've just talked to you about the fact that evaluation is tricky um, once we start to go out into the world and we look at our assumptions and we look at our measures and we think about the complexity of the people whom we are trying to change it can really you know absolutely blow up our theory of change and um, our desired result but i do think that we can gather evidence for effectiveness and when we think about effective outcomes, I think we can observe at least some incrementally changed outcomes in a person with respect to her or his knowledge, attitudes, and practices resulting from even a, a simple exposure, right? Just like a quick intervention on food sampling. We're going to have to do a little work, but I think we can do it compared to full-blown results, you know? So not that we don't want to have full-blown results of people stop eating animals, but seeing causality for that, I'll talk about causality here for a second, um, seeing evidence of that for sustained behavior change, you know, that results in this big result, it's, it's long-term, it's costly, and it's a very difficult endeavor. And I think Pablo is probably going to address those comments some in a few moments, but for you who might be doing, um, again, kind of the community outreach programs, right, of the screenings, the samplings, what have you, I do think you can see um, some effectiveness of your outcome and, you know, at least see some, I'm going to say causality, maybe you're not getting all the way to the end of the line, but if your goal was to get someone to feed back to you that they learned now how to define veganism, that is progress and that's a good thing. So we're talking about, you know, short-term exposure in a single day or a short-term period versus these longer programs that have various touch points through them. And again, Pablo is going to kind of touch on this um, soon. So if you're out there and, you know, you feel as if like, well, gee, I don't have the resources to do this full-blown evaluation of something. Is there something I can do that's kind of quick and dirty to get a sense of if my action is making some sense, is making some progress with people? So this is taken from a training model in which we can get, you know, immediate reaction to an intervention or a message. So for example, well, let me just go. Let me go forward here. So let's say you do a screening and you want the reaction of the folks who came. You know, you can do the screening. Everyone's sitting in their seat. And you, you could do the following. You could say, hey, thank you for joining us today for the screening of this documentary. Gee, the messages might have been hard for you to see, but we'd love to know how did you feel about this screening? Now, you have a couple options, right? You could do a, you could do a show of hands. You could say, hey, how many people in the audience learned a lot and they want to explore more about vegan living? And let's just say you have 100 people in the audience and 50 of them raised their hand. And then you say, okay, we didn't quite capture everybody. How many of you are thinking about what you learned, including if you could ever learn a vegan lifestyle? And 10 people raised their hand. And I said, are some of you out there, maybe you just didn't pick up any messages and five people raised their hand 
And then, you know, five more say, I got nothing out of this film. I mean, at least what you would get, you would get some sense of the level of knowledge that you imparted to people, or at least how many people picked up something from the film that you showed them and they want to explore more about vegan vegan living, which tells you something about their attitudes. Um, and also, um, you know, about their practice, that could they live a vegan lifestyle? So you can learn things on the spot, if you will, from your, you know, shorter term interventions. This could be a written survey, or it could be a show of hands. Um, so it could be a show of hands. You could ask them to drop something in a comment box. It's just free form. Tell us what you learned. Um, you could have them fill out a survey. And um, as an example, if I can get to it here, I've shown you like maybe a little example that you could do in SurveyMonkey. So let me see if I can get there quickly, or not so quickly. Uh, let's see. Okay, so this is Survey Monkey, and let's say you're showing a film, and you put this thing in Survey Monkey, and you give people the link, and you say, "Hey, take your mobile out right now, and would you mind going into Survey Monkey at this link and filling out this survey?" So you say, "Hey, just thank you for responding to a few questions on what new information was learned by seeing this film." Knowledge, a knowledge-based question. Did you know that cows make friends among themselves? Yes or no? Did you know that carbon dioxide added to the atmosphere from livestock accounts for an estimated 70 to 50% of global greenhouse gases? Yes or no? This would be a practice question. Um, you read the literature accompanying the film, and now I feel confident how to identify plant-based foods. And they can say, oh, I strongly agree. I agree, I don't, you know, I strongly disagree, and everything in between. So that's a that's a practice question. How about an attitude? This film has convinced me to consider a vegan lifestyle. Yes, I'm really interested. Nope, I'm not interested at all. And again, everything in between. And again, the last practice question. I feel confident that I can now prepare plant-based foods so that they that they have the know-how to plant to prepare plant-based foods. I agree, you know, I neither disagree, I disagree, I strongly disagree. At any rate, this could be something that you could do that would really help you a lot, I think, learn what your audience um, perceived from your action. Um, did, did they pick up some, you know, practices, new skills, practices to be able to do what they learned? And what is their attitude? How has their attitude perhaps shifted from the time that they came to your screening um, until they're now going to leave you again and you know go back out into the world. So there are a few things, um, just a few examples, a few modest examples of things that you know you need not feel this is total doom and gloom and that you can never practice um, any type of evaluation. <clears throat> so speaking of evaluation, and not that we're done with our webinar. In fact, we are not at all done with our webinar, but. I would like to ask my colleague, um, Leah, if she can, to please put in a link to an evaluation for this webinar. So we would be, or a survey, I should say, it's not a full-blown evaluation, but we would be very interested in getting your feedback on this uh, webinar today. But please don't leave us, because now we're going to turn to Pablo Molman from ProVeg, who's going to give us another more sophisticated example of evaluation efforts for a veggie campaign. Great. So, uh, yes, uh, my name is uh, Pablo Moleman. I uh, I work with ProVeg Netherlands as uh, well. I, I I could say as head of research, but it's uh, it's only one of one of many responsibilities since we're quite a small organization. Um, it's more of a hobby that we that that I do alongside uh, my other activism. Um, we do a lot of different um, types of work. We do uh, we do offline work. We do online work. We do corporate work. And in all these fields, uh, we try to implement evaluation to see and to check if we're moving in the right direction. And if not, to be able to know um, how to how to change our direction uh, in a better way. 
So today I will be mainly focusing on the Veggie Challenge, which is an online campaign. Uh, it is a 30-day challenge, as I'm sure many of you will know, uh, because there, there are many similar campaigns around the world, like uh, Veganuary or uh, 22 Vegan, or other campaigns that basically challenge uh, people to take a pledge or make a commitment to, to, change their, to work on changing their diet for a limited uh, amount of time. Uh, and one of the benefits of this type of campaign is that it's really evaluation friendly there it doing uh, online work in general and this this type of campaign specifically offers uh, a lot of opportunities for doing measurements that you that sadly you don't have in a lot of other uh, types of activism now we also do measurement of uh of, of fairs and of film screenings and of every uh, of, and i will i will get into that a little bit uh as well so don't 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 think that um that the 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 things that we'll be talking about will only work for 30 day challenges specifically um but I, I think this is a nice example of showing the the the, the kind of opportunities that are that, that 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 there are is this thing in the way perhaps maybe i should um so um, the, the, the veggie challenge basically uh, challenges participants to eat less meat for 30 days. And it's a little bit different than uh, most, uh, most similar campaigns in that people can set their own personalized challenge. So we don't, we don't ask people to go uh, vegan for 30 days. Um, they can also go vegetarian for 30 days or have meat-free days. So the, the minimum requirement is that they have one vegetarian day uh, per week um, it's also personalized in the sense that there's not a defined period of time period when they can take the challenge like doing it in, in January uh, as a New Year's resolution they can they can set their own start date um, and um, uh, so it, uh, as you can see there there are there are several op options and it's, it's it's a personalized challenge now of course we want everybody to go vegan so why why do we do this it, it has to do with um trying to get the biggest amount of impact because as leslie already uh, showed going vegan is a, is a journey for many people it's not a not a not a split second decision it's not something that happens overnight for most people um, but it's more of a continuum where you move from being an omnivore to being a vegan um and um we, we want people we want people to move um uh, of, uh over this over this scale in the right direction but not every step is as impactful as the other uh for instance if you um one one reason is that um it's it's, it's interesting to address omnivores because ju there's just so many of them uh 40 percent of the population uh, or or even up to 90 if you uh, if you include the vegetarians as omnivores um, so they are the biggest target group, but they also offer the, the most opportunity for saving animal lives. Because uh, as you can see, an, an omnivore in the Netherlands consumes about 20, uh, 27 uh, animals a year. Um, perhaps in the United States, uh, people eat more animals even. Uh, and if, if, if you just get an omnivore to move to become a reducitarian, uh, you, will, you will help this person save 13 animals uh, per year. Whilst if you get a vegetarian to go vegan to take the, the last step, um, they will just be saving about two animals per year. So if our focus is on saving as much animals as possible, um, getting an omnivore to go reducitarian is more interesting than getting a vegetarian to go vegan. Now this, this logic of course only holds uh, if we think that lowering our ask, so asking people to, to go vegetarian instead of vegan, actually helps get more omnivores on board and this is an open question uh, that you're probably familiar with, with because it's uh, sometimes hotly discussed within the, within the vegan activist movement and I, I i cannot say that i have conclusive evidence about this um but actually we uh, we we did base our decision to uh to focus on reducitarianism on an evaluation that we did ourselves because we uh, 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 about six years ago we used to do a totally vegan challenge campaign um, 
and we, we, we evaluated subscriptions and we saw that quite a large proportion of the uh, people subscribing to our challenge were vegetarian. So in 2013, uh, Forty-three percent of uh, of subscribers were already vegetarian when they started taking part in the challenge. In 2014, it was was also 35 percent, uh, and there were actually also a lot of part-time vegans or vegans subscribing. I, I guess they just wanted to get the, the recipes in their inbox. Um, and we started thinking if we if we sort of lower the the bar for participating, will we get more omnivores? And indeed, um, uh, we found that uh, that uh, that this this actually happened. We we got less vegetarians, and we got more omnivores taking part. It's a bit difficult to compare, and we also compared against uh, Veganuary. Um, but because there's there's the, the the surveys used use different definitions, they don't always add up up in the same way. But if you if you for instance combine uh, all the diet groups that you, that could be described as non-veg. Then it's it's clear that uh, with the lower ask we get a, a higher amount of uh, of non-veg participants than we have with the vegan ask. Now, ob obviously we don't want to support people to consume uh, cheese or eggs. So actually, the the challenge that they subscribe to is in fact a fully vegan challenge. All the recipes that they receive are 100% vegan. All the information they receive is 100% vegan. But it's just uh, geared to a slightly different uh, target audience in the way that we phrase it. Because the most important thing that we want for people in order for them to get this information in the first place is that they sign up and that they make a commitment to change their diet. Um, um, so what we try to do in the, in the challenge is to make, uh, make the experience of people uh, as positive as possible, of course, and evaluation is one way of figuring out what what people need in order to to have the best possible experience, and also to have a personal experience. So, we, we the 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 different types of interventions that we use as a part of the veggie challenge are partly based on evaluations that we did of uh, potential or past participants. Where they where they stated their own needs, where they, for instance, stated that they were uh, would be very interested in receiving uh, weekly menus instead of just daily menus, or where, where they stated that they they required more health information. Um, but also, we based some of some of our of, of our content on social psychology, on knowledge that has been uh, gained before. On what 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 sort of uh, tools or information make it easier for people to change their behavior? So we try to be uh, supportive by um, allowing uh, people to uh, ask questions over email or in a in a Facebook group. We know that it's important uh, if you're changing your diet that you don't feel like you're doing it all by yourself, and you want to know how other people are doing it. So it's, it's great if you can have direct contact with other people that are taking part in the challenge as well, or experienced vegans that can, can help you. So we have, we have Facebook groups and email support for this. Um, personalized content, with, meaning that if you sign up as an omnivore, you don't get the exact same newsletters than when you sign up as a vegetarian, for instance. Um, it's, it's important for people um, that they feel that, that the, that the information they get fits with the point where they are, um, because it 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 makes them it makes them more empowered to to change. Um, so we we offer like basic basic tools like a recipe database, uh, a restaurant database, uh, a database of vegan products that can be found in the supermarket. Of course, all the all the recipes are also geared towards supermarkets, so that people don't have to go to online shops or to uh, specialty shops to, to 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 make their first vegan meal. Um, and we list the discounted products in every week in the supermarket, because people, of course, they they uh, some people um, they 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 are living on a they are eating on a on a budget, and we want to make vegan food available uh, as available as possible for them as well. Um, and people who have health questions, they have the opportunity to, uh, to, 
to attend webinars with a professional dietitian. Um, so we don't we don't actually know if all this effort that we put into making this uh, journey as pleasant as possible if it actually pays off in terms of saving more animals. But it is certainly something um, that we are interested in 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 researching in the future. Um, going back to one other point that uh, Leslie made about um, about single interventions uh, versus long-term interventions, I think that one of the most interesting uh, things about um, uh, about about this sort of uh, online campaigns is that you can actually use them to extend your uh, offline work. So if you're having, uh, for instance, uh, a screening, a film screening, or you're, uh, you're hosting a, a, a veg fest or some other type of event, uh, or you're just talking to people on the street, you can have a, a tablet computer with you, or maybe just a uh, a, 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 a clip, a paper clip, with um, where where people can uh, can sign up for the challenge um, um, uh, using a pen. And you 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 can you can actually extend your contact uh, with them. So you're turning offline uh, outreach into online outreach, and you're turning single intervention into longer term interventions into multi interventions. Um, and we actually, we do this ourselves, but we also offer this as a sort of free service to other groups that are doing, for instance, cubes of truth or earthlings experience. And the interesting thing is that not only are you creating follow-up for the work that you're doing, and you're increasing the chance that you will be creating some diet change because you're getting, by showing people a video, for instance, you're getting them interested into changing their diet. And once they sign up for the challenge, you're giving them the tools that they need to actually do it. But you also create opportunities for measuring the impact of your offline work. So you're extending it, but you're also better able to measure it. Um, because what we can actually do is uh, we, we can add uh, tags, like TAG tags, like little little labels to the to the sign up form that we use, and we could, can use different sign up. Uh, slightly different sign-up pages every day or every uh, type of um, uh, every type of um, um, of collecting signatures that, that 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 we do. So it's possible, for instance, uh, to 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 that that we can um, localize uh, in our in our uh, on, in our online database all the people who signed up for the veggie challenge through cubes of truth or through film screenings and we and, and once we have results on their diet change we can actually compare uh, different types of uh, offline advocacy against each other uh, you can also start measuring conversion rates so for instance uh, we've we've done a lot of uh, paper leafleting in the past um, and we, we just included links um, to the to sign up, special links to sign up to the veggie challenge in the inside the leaflets and we found out that the the conversion rate from paper to online subscription was almost zero so that was that was for for us one of the one of the first um signs that leafleting might not be as effective as we uh, at the time thought it was later on we also did more elaborate studies on it and it, it turned out that for us at least in, in in the context that we were doing it it wasn't working very well but the, the, the fact that we, we we noticed that um like if if you're distributing 2000 leaflets and not a single person signs up for the challenge then then probably something's not really going as planned um and the interesting thing um um so and, and another benefit is that um if you get uh if you get someone to to sign up um to your um to the challenge uh you can get back to them whenever you want because you have their email address so you can also offer them uh you, you can invite them for new film screenings uh you can invite them for events you can invite them to take the challenge another time. Maybe the first round they implemented meat-free days, 
and a, a year later you sent them another email uh, asking them how they are doing if they if they still uh, are benefiting from the changes that they made and if they're maybe ready to make the next step so you can actually create a sort of loops and people can take the challenge again and you you, you change from doing single intervention to multi-intervention and one of the most um, wonderful things for me is that we have this database where we collect information where we where, uh, where we where we where we see like uh, the different uh, contexts that we have in the different uh, places that they've been and you can see names reappearing so like there's there's this person and three years ago they first showed up at our veggie world event then uh, a couple year, uh, a couple months later they sign up for the veggie challenge to try to go vegetarian and uh, uh, another uh, like uh, another few year later you, you you find them back but they are not listed as a participant participant anymore but they are listed as an activist and they are actually doing doing an outreach work for us so you can actually uh, it, like do doing measurement even if you're doing it like um not 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 on a very um deep level if you're just tracking people and tracking diets it allows you to see how to see them moving along the continuum from omnivore to vegan which is of course really rewarding um and if you if you like build a large enough database and we're hoping to do that you can also use that for doing research on how people move how quickly they move and how we can improve their their movements along the continuum so back to the back to the measurement of the veggie challenge. So we we uh, the, the first data collection that we do is actually right at the at the starting point when they subscribe, uh, when they fill in their current diet and their challenge, their personal challenge diet. And it, I think it's it's really important that we have this information for 100% of participants, um, because it this is the information that gives us the the, the most full picture of who the people are that we are working with. Then afterwards we send them, uh, after the challenge has ended, we send them a survey um, asking them about their, uh, their, their diet, uh, about their diet change and about how they, how they liked the challenge. Um, and of course, not, not everybody uh, fills, uh, fills in this, this, uh, this survey, which is, uh, it is a problem. I will, I will talk about some more uh, later on, and we ask them um, if, if they plan to continue eating more plant-based after the veggie challenge is over. And now it's it's, it's quite good to know that that almost all people, uh, close to 90% of of participants, um, they 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 state that yes, they do plan to eat more plant-based now the veggie challenge is over. So we know that there's uh, there is at least some amount of diet change. Doesn't mean that they go vegetarian. Doesn't mean that they go vegan. But there's some amount of diet change in almost all of the participants. And if you split it up by pre-challenge diet group, so the the diet that they had before they uh, they started out, um, you see that it's equal over almost all groups, except of course the vegans, which uh, which we're quite happy to see that they're all staying vegan after the challenge. We wouldn't want them to change back. Then, if we go on to to ask about their their current diets uh, after they uh, ended the challenge, we see that there's in general a movement of people towards um, new diet groups. So um, only about 25% of people who were om omnivores who self-identified as omnivores before starting the challenge still identified as omnivores after ending the challenge. The largest group of omnivores um, identified as part-time vegetarians afterwards, and some even uh, went vegan straight away. Um, I'd say about 20%. So for the vegetarians, uh, also some went vegan, actually slightly less. Uh, oh no, I'm looking at the part-time vegetarians now. Uh, some of them remained part-time vegetarians um, uh, some of them uh, became vegetarians, and this this way makes it like you get a you get an idea of the sort of changes that you're seeing, um, and you can use those to improve your 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 message and to improve your campaign. Um, it also allows you to make 
uh, nice guesstimates of the amount of animals that you're saving. And here we uh, included only the diet, the, the diet change where, where people changed from one group to another. So we only looked at the, the people who say, say that I was an omnivore before and after that I was a vegetarian or, or a, a part-time vegetarian. Um, obviously there, there might also be within group change. So people might be changing their diet, eating less meat, but not changing the, the group in which they identify. So it could even be that the amount of animals that we are, are saving is, is larger. Uh, and we on, also we only um, took one year of uh, because we we don't really know how how long lasting the the diet change is yet. Uh, we we assumed that they would only uh, continue this this new diet for a year, and after that we we don't know if probably a lot of them will still be eating less meat, but we don't we don't take credit for that. Also because there's probably other uh, other campaigns and other in interventions influencing them at the same time. So perhaps it would not uh, be fair to assume, assume um, that people will continue to be vegetarian or vegan for 70 years and it's all down to us. So um, we estimated, we, we, we were able to estimate that we save, we're saving about uh, 69,000 animals per year, which is which equals about um, two uh, two laying hen farms um, put uh, put together. Um, this is this is for us. This is the most important metric. This is what we're what, what we're optimizing everything we do for. But it's also interesting to look at environmental impact. Um, we're saving a lot of. Uh, we can say that we're saving a lot of hectares of uh, of farmland, uh, about uh, 412 football fields. We're saving a lot of carbon. If you want to, um, if if you want to reverse the change that we made, you need to get into your car and uh, drive around the equator over 300 times, and uh, and then you you will have undone the, the 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 positive change that we created by helping people eat less meat. And we're saving a lot of drinking water. Um, you can you can even take this take this a bit further. We also looked. At uh, the, the 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 amount of uh, social costs that we saved by changing diets, and we estimated that we were saving about uh, seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year in in social costs, mainly uh, avoided healthcare costs and avoided environmental damage costs. Um, you might you might even say that 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 you, you can make a calculation that um, you're saving about. Uh, 310 healthy human life years uh, by avoiding uh, by avoiding uh, disease. Now, of course, this this all is a bit like building a large uh, mansion on a very uh, uh, weak uh, foundation, because there's there's a lot that we don't know, and th these numbers are probably not even near near ball ballpark numbers, um, but they are they are interesting for for creating awareness. And for for getting getting like some idea of the kind of possibilities um, that that this type of campaigns uh, can have. Um, so as as I uh, as we saw at the, in the previous slide, we have different ways of attracting um, attracting uh, subscribers for the Veggie Challenge. Um, some through street work and events, but also uh, some online. Actually, the, the vast majority of participants that we get for our challenge, we get through online advert uh, advertisements using uh, Facebook. Um, and this, the, our whole um, advertising, uh, online advertising work is made possible, being made possible by Batch Fund. Um, and what we, what we love about um, doing Facebook advertising is that it allows for very specific targeting. So you can uh, you can be really selective in the, the the type of people that you want to reach with your message, and of course we don't want to reach vegans because they we, we well we want to reach them of course to to become activists but not particularly to sign up to the veggie challenge. Um, we want to reach we don't want to reach people who are not interested at all because we will just be spending advertising money on them, and they will not sign up anyway. 
So we're looking for people who might be interested in health, for instance, or in, in, in the environment, or who might be interested in animal welfare. Um, and the beauty of doing uh, Facebook advertising is that you can actually change your message depending on the sort of, uh, sort of target that you want to reach. So we make um, a, a, health, uh, a health messaging ad uh, specifically for the health interested audience. We make uh, a, a different ad for people interested in the environment. And also because we have these, these, um, these links, these, uh, we, 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 we can put these little, little uh, digital labels in the, in the URL links that we use. We can actually um, track every participant back to the, the type of advertisement that, that made them sign up. So we can also, if, if we're trying out a new target group and we're not sure if we can find many omnivores in there, we can just, um, we can just look up all the, the, the data of the people who signed up through that particular ad, look at their pre-challenge diets, and then we know um, if, if this particular target group is good for, uh, for targeting non-vegans. Um, well, there, there's a lot more to be said about online advertising. I think probably would pro probably be possible to have a, an entire webinar dedicated to how to optimize this sort of work. But the, the, the main thing is that the, the, my main message would be that this type of, uh, this type of advertising um, is really great for optimizing. It's really, it's really much more easy to optimize this sort of campaign than, for instance, advertising in newspapers or advertising on the streets. And it's also much easier to do measurements on them. Um, we started. We only started doing um, online advertising in uh, 2016, when uh, when VegFund started supporting us, um, and we saw an immediate increase in the amount of people signing up for the challenge. Um, it really, really gave the whole campaign uh, a tremendous boost. Um, and the nice thing about uh, advertising uh, on Facebook is that it also shows you how much uh, money you are spending per person that is um, signing up or like if you're if you if you're trying to sell uh, uh, I don't know if, if you're trying to sell products over over Facebook it will do the same thing so it will show you the costs per lead meaning the, the, the costs per person that you attracted to your particular service or to buy your product um, so in 2017 on average it cost us about one euro and 36 cents to get one person to sign up for the veggie challenge and it's you can actually compare that against the the costs of um of tabling or of of hosting a movie screening which is also like an in, in, in this interesting way of looking at, at it of course we don't know if people signing up online have the same commitment as people signing up after they've just seen a movie but we could actually also measure that because we can we can look at the results and we can see if people who signed up uh, after having a movie screening if we if we're seeing more diet change than people who just signed up uh, because they saw, saw an ad on Facebook and then went up went on with their lives afterwards. So you can actually compare uh, sign up quality um, um, in this way. And of course, because we have this ballpark number of animals saved, we can even make a guesstimate that it costs about 18 euro cents to save one animal life using uh, Facebook campaigns. Um, yeah, it, 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 it really astounds me how, how, far you can, how far you can take this kind of measurement if you're doing online work. Um, now, of course, um, there's, also, there's also a lot of challenges. Um, surveys aren't perfect and it's actually, quite hard to make a good survey. There's a lot of problems with surveying and I'm, I'm not, an, not an expert myself. My background is in uh, environmental economics. So um, I, don't, I, 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 don't, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I cannot claim that I know too much about it. Uh, I, I happen to have a, a friend whose job is to evaluate the impact of psychi uh, uh, psychiatric uh, treatment on patients which has some simil similarities to the work that we're doing. 
um, and he's um, he's been a great help at improving the the quality of our surveys. Um, some of the main main problems with surveys, for instance, is that it's it's hard to get accurate data from people if they don't understand the questions or if they don't understand the words. Um, a lot of people think they are vegetarians, um, but they're not. If you if you if you ask them, are you a vegetarian? They will say yes. And then if you ask them, did you eat beef uh, in the past week? A lot of them will also say yes. So it's it's really important to get the questions right. And um, uh, animal charity evaluators has uh, some very helpful guidelines on their website on how to set up a good survey. So if you're thinking of doing survey survey work for whatever type of intervention you want to study, uh, I would really recommend to to check out their website. Then some some other problems is is sample size, response bias, and social des des desirability bias, which are all like bit scientific terms for um, for very simple problems. Like some sample size basically means that if you don't get enough people to fill in your questionnaire, you you cannot really use it, use your results to say something about all of the people that are taking part in your intervention um, because they might not be rep representative of the whole. So obviously it's really important to get uh, a, a good amount of people um, to fill in your your survey. Um, if you're doing a, if, if if you're doing a, a film screening, for instance, uh, it might be uh, useful to to hand out the surveys to everyone. Um, because then a, a, a much larger number will fill in the survey than if you just uh, put a, a stack of uh, a stack of surveys next to the exit door and you're just hoping for them to fill it in. Uh, if you're doing online work, sometimes it helps to send out reminders uh, so that you get more people to fill in, and it helps to make um, to make surveys accessible and simple, of course, because if, if people are, are looking at a very big and complicated survey, uh, they might just quit. Then response bias is also a really important one. Um, some people might be more likely to, to fill in your survey than others, um, especially the, the people who are most enthusiastic. They might be all, the, the people who are already vegans, or they might be the people who changed their diets the most. Um, they might they, they are probably much more likely to fill in a, a survey after uh, after meeting you or working with you than the people who are not that interested at, at all. And this is an important thing to account for. Um, social desirability basically means that people tend to fill in questionnaires or to answer questions in a way that they think other people might expect them to. So if you're asking people, are you changing your diet? probably they will say, uh, yes, of course I did. I'm, it, it, it's become quite fashionable for people to say that they are uh, eating less meat. So it's, it's important um, to notice that, that probably this is a type of bias, bias that never will fully go away. Um, but there are ways to, to alleviate it a little bit uh, by making your questions very specific. Um, and there's actually even uh, separate questionnaires to test the, the extent to which people are receptive to social desirability bias. And you can actually, you can find this on the ACE website as well. You can add this to your questionnaire. Might lower your response, response bias a bit because it's, uh, th there's some pretty weird questions on that list. But if, the, if people fill in these, these questions, you can scale them on a one to 10 scale of, uh, of, 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 uh, of social desirability bias. And you can actually, um, like people who, 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 who seem to be very receptive to social des desirability, you can take them out of your, uh, out of your survey. And of course, um, the, the most in, maybe the most important question of all is how long lasting is the, the effect that we are creating? Or if we don't see any effect, uh, might there be uh, an effect further down the road? So some of the things that we are currently implementing or planning to implement uh, in the near future to, to help tackle these problems um, is making it much more interesting for people to fill in surveys. So we do this through, we, we, we're, we're also working on making a, a, an app for people doing the veggie challenge. And if they have this app, um, they, they, can, they, they get frequent messages from their personal coach asking them how they're doing 
if they if they might be willing to fill in a brief questionnaire and if they do so they get direct feedback on for instance the amount of animals that they have saved or they might get uh, an, an extra recipe that's not available to them if they don't fill in the survey so it makes it more interesting for them to fill in this fill in the survey because they get something in return and we believe we hope that if we're doing this the right way it will also probably help to strengthen the relationship because they feel that they are that that they're that how they are doing or their opinion about the campaign is important to us um, and they actually really want to tell us how they are doing and they really really want uh, us to know um, that they changed their diet of course um, once you have their email address you can send them more questionnaires you could you could even send a questionnaire a year later probably the response rate will be much lower but there 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 is at least possibility to to be measuring further down the down the timeline i would always advise to not just measure diet change because diet change as leslie uh, uh, also uh, explained is, is just the basically the end product of a much longer process and we can also be quite happy by just knowing that we created attitudinal change in, in people um, and there's 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 simple questions that you can use to measure attitude um, and there's also very complicated questions there's, there's like there's even um, uh, uh, like scientifically um, um, that there's there's scientists that, that have worked on specific lists to measure speciesism in people and you can scale them uh, on a scale from one to ten on how speciesist they are so if you take this questionnaire several times um, you might actually be able to see people move uh, move along this scale from being to, to, to be becoming less speciesist in their attitudes now this will probably not 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 work um, if we send this to all the people because they probably will will get very very much annoyed with all these uh, complicated uh, questionnaires but you might be able to do this uh, in a controlled environment so if you take a, a small group of students for for instance uh, and you make them part of a part of an experiment and they might get some study points or other rewards for taking part in the experiment they might be willing to fill in these questionnaires uh, over a longer period of time and you could be doing uh, you could be even doing research on on speciesism and then of course there's other ways of of measuring than doing surveys um, I, I think we could we could be doing a lot lot more with uh, with with these. Uh, for instance, if you're if you're sending out emails, uh, the the email program doesn't matter if you're using Campaign Monitor or Mailchimp or another program. It always tracks the amount of uh, openings of the emails, and it also tracks the amount of clicks. Um, and of course, we don't know if people who open their emails. Uh, it, or open recipes we don't know if they will actually cook the recipes um, but it gives you some indication of their amount of interest for the information that you're providing them with uh, so um, you can you can you can use these metrics as well and and one thing that we are actually thinking of is um is is is, 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 is putting these metrics together with some uh survey results to see if there might be a statistical correlation, and you could actually say that maybe uh, if, if 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 newsletter open rates or other indicators of their uh, their interest in the campaign, if there is a correlation with diet change, you could maybe even use these figures as a proxy for diet change. Um, I hope um, I didn't make it too complicated near the end. Um, and um, I hope that the things that I told were interesting to you and that my, uh, my, limited, um, uh, my limited English was not too much of a problem. And if, if there's any questions, I'd, I'd love to help. Um, you can also uh, send me an email if you have any questions at uh, pablo.moleman at um, Thank you very much. Thank you, Pablo. Um, much appreciated. That was really excellent. And I could hear all of the terms that we've discussed today earlier in my comments threaded through your presentation from logic to evidence to time horizons to the actual um, program structuring and how you drove 
evaluation, how you designed by starting from the point of omnivores, um, what your assumptions were. You know, we saw measurements and you spoke about ca causality. And then, of course, um, incremental behavior change. So I just wanted to leave everyone with um, the idea. So that, that was a, just a great case study, I think. Thank you. Um, but to, to leave everyone with the idea that, you know, even though maybe a, none of these single interventions or, you know, a full vegan challenge with many multiple touch points is going to take someone all the way over the finish line of stickiness, if you will, as being a, a vegan, um, well, I think we've heard from Pablo very clearly that, you know, that his program is aspirational and it has um, taken people on a vegan journey and has created behavior change. So that was a really great case study. Thank you very much. So um, we are willing to stick around to take questions. For anyone who may have a question, please pose them. I did take the primary takeaways of this webinar um, into this presentation, which I'm not going to go through now because I want to leave time for questions, and Pablo suggested you could look on the animal charity evaluators, probably as well as the Phonolytics websites, and then here are three evaluation resources caught off the press from the U.S. National Evaluation Conference that was held recently, and otherwise, um, we would deeply appreciate your feedback. And if you would sign up for our other webinars, we would be most appreciative. But we want to allow you any, we'll stick around for any questions you might have right now. So if you want to type those in, if you want to chat those in, we're happy to answer them. And maybe you could ask if they're for Pablo or Leslie. Thank you. Any questions out there? Leslie, this is Leia. Um, we've had a few questions come through, and I'm happy to read them out. Yes, thank you. Um, one question we have for Pablo. How can you affirm 96.184 animals are still alive thanks to Veggie Challenge? Um, do you have some background on, this, on these numbers that you might be able to share? Um, sure. Uh, yeah, am I am I uh, on out on audio? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so well, obviously we we cannot really affirm um, because it's it's all very tentative, and and th these these are probably not animals that are still alive, but that that might not be raised um, uh, raised because we because like the demand for them has lowered, um, but we we just looked at average Dutch uh, diets. We made some assumptions on the, the diets of, uh, of, of reduced vegetarians. Um, and then based on the, the, the data we collected uh, on diet change of, of our participants, uh, we extrapolated uh, and, and, we, and we, we, we calculated this amount of animals, which is really like really simple and basic uh, mathematics, um, but not really strong science, I would say, um, because you're you're basically taking a, 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 sm a small sample of your participants that filled in the questionnaire, um, and like we, we think we have pretty good data on them, and it seems that they are quite representative, but still, you're you're extrapolating a lot. Um, so we don't, we, 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 honestly, we don't know how much diet change we have seen in the people that didn't fill in the questionnaire. Then on the, then on the other hand, the, the assumptions that we made were really conservative. So we only assumed that people would be changing their diet for one year, for instance. And we only calculated the diet change of people who actually stated that they went from one diet group to the other. And I think this was about maybe, 30% of, 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 uh, of, of, of the total people that, that we surveyed, they actually changed groups. And 90% stated that they changed their diets. So there remains about 60% uh, of people who, who stated that they changed their diets in some way, but we didn't have enough information to state that they actually ate less animals, so we left them out. 
so what, like looking looking at one way at it, uh, the numbers is the number is probably very low, very much lower than the actual number. Looking at it from another direction, the number is probably a, a lot bigger. And I, I couldn't really say which of the two pools is the stronger one. So this is this is just something that we that we do um, to get to get a basic ID, to get a basic understanding of of how this works. And we hope to imp improve our measurements uh, to get a better understanding, but we will probably never know for sure. Um, and if, if people are interested in uh, in in getting the seeing the calculations, uh, we 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 have a we have a report about it, and we we can we can send it around. That would be great. Um, we would love to, to put that up on our website with some of our resources. Mm -hmm. um, we had we had one other question, Leslie, um, and and I think this is relevant because Veg Fund has asked, actually used this tactic. Somebody asked, would you recommend incentivizing attendees post event to fill out surveys with raffle prizes, etc.? Oh uh, yeah, possibly. I, I definitely would consider that. Yeah, and I, I wrote back to that person that Veg Fund has even used that tactic ourselves um, with some of our surveys. Um, we've offered raffle prizes and things like that. Yeah, it would be it would be something um, interesting to consider. So thank you for the suggestion. Any other questions out there? Well, thank you again. And if you would give us feedback, we would be really most appreciative, including if there are you know, more topics of evaluation that you would like to discuss or if this is something worthwhile and that we would like to go deeper into. And Pablo, I thank you again. That was really excellent. You're welcome. Much appreciated. Okay, thank you everyone.